So initially the title of my presentation was just going to be energy efficiency and eco roofs, which is really one of the core things that I've been working on in the last few years. Uh, but I wanted to give you a little bit more of an overview of some of the other activities that we do in my, my research group. So we're going to start with an overview of some of the activities that we are doing that aren't necessarily directly related to green roofs, but rather green buildings. <coughs> so one of the most recent things that we've gotten into is I had a student, a very talented uh, undergrad actually, it's shown here, Seth, um, who was interesting, interested in green building uh, questions and questions related to ventilation, indoor air quality, and energy use. And we came up with this idea that we've got this beautiful building across the way here. You can look straight out the window right out at the Broadway building uh, with the bricks, red bricks. And it's a mixed use building uh, with, there we go, with um, basically eight, one said eight floors, seven floors of dorm-like housing. And um, they all have operable windows. And every room in that, every uh, dorm room in that building is also submetered so we can determine their hourly energy consumption. And so one thing we, we're doing in his study, and we don't have um, a lot of data from it yet because we just started getting the energy data online about a week ago, but we've put sensors in 30 of the rooms, and this is just um, one of the sample sensors. We mount them in the windows and they basically just have little uh, magnetic switches. And so they're t attached to the window so you can determine if the window is open or not. And they have a radio transmitter that allows these 30 uh, sensor units to form a network so that we can, we can download data from anywhere we want instantaneously and keep track of it. And all the sensors, you know, each one of these radios can probably only go uh, through a couple of walls, but they can talk from one to the next to the next to the next and pass data. So it's a very neat sensor technology that we're exploring for a wide range of applications in monitoring buildings. Um, if you promise not to unscrew anything, you can take a look at it. <laughs> um, but but the, whole, the whole question behind this study is, students right now have operable windows. How are they using them? And to what extent is that impacting the energy consumption in the room? We have, we have actual data that we can get now. And we have a, a working building energy model that we put together for that building. And so we can play with how infiltration of outside air affects the energy consumption in the rooms and, and uh, compare the two studies. So that's one thing that we're doing. Um, when I first came to Portland State, I had done quite a bit of work in urban heat islands. So when I, what, what, what has happened over the last, gosh, I got my PhD in 93, so last 15 years or so, probably the first 10 years of that career has been focused on really large scale phenomena, urban climates. So I've done a lot of work on urban heat island modeling, urban heat island measurements, looking at how climate change can impact the city. Um, and so that was the core of, of my first big proposal here that, that we submitted and got funded from the NSF. Uh, but what our research does is it really looks at the energy balance in a city, which is, which is complicated with respect to the unbuilt surroundings in that you have this complex network of roughness elements that affects both the radiation exchange, so the, s the sunlight, the energy from the sun coming in, being reflected off surfaces, absorbed by surfaces, and so forth. We have emissions of waste heat from energy consuming activities, cars, buildings, cooling towers and buildings and whatnot. So it's a very complex um, sort of urban energy budget. And we're interested in trying to understand, based on composition of, of cities, how the hot surfaces of some rooftops and roadways affects the air that's in contact with it and, and ultimately creates what we call the urban heat island, the, the fact that cities tend to be warmer than their suburbs. So we've done a lot of work um, on the modeling side. I do a lot of atmospheric modeling, which is not as exciting to show here, so I, I haven't put it in this slide specifically. But if you look in the upper right-hand corner, you see uh, what looks like a fairly modest instrument package that we created for measuring the urban climate. So this is a, a suite of instruments that data logs the um, GPS location and speed of the vehicle, the air temperature, the humidity, um, and it just mounts in the car window and you, you drive these around the city 
And if we link that information with GIS data resources that tell us what's the land use in the proximity of those measurements, we can develop these quantitative linkages that tell us how land use affects the urban thermal environment. And then we can, even though we've only driven on roadways, we can map the entire city for the urban heat island. You see Forest Park here being cool, in fact being a cool island of three to four degrees C on a typical summer day. And you see hot spots in the industrial areas and the, and the built up urban areas. So that's one, one tool that we developed here at Portland State. And we've applied it here in Portland, we've applied it in Houston. Uh, I had a colleague at Hon in Hong Kong, at the University of Hong Kong, that was interested in applying it there. And I was going down to Hong Kong for a talk anyway. So I packed all my sensors in a suitcase. We brought six of them with us. And we did a little measurement campaign using taxis in, in Hong Kong. And so these images show you the, the traverse routes that the vehicles drove. And the colors indicate the temperature relative to uh, a surrounding rural site. So it's a very powerful tool that we've developed. It's a really nice way of visualizing how urban development impacts the urban climate. So I want to segue now into what the, the main topic of the, the presentation is this morning, which is the green roof or eco roof research that we're doing. And we have a number of research questions that we've been pursuing around green roofs. The first is related to the energy consumption of the building. So when you put a green roof on a building, how does that impact the energy consumption of the building? So obviously, it could have an impact on air, on air conditioning loads, but also on winter lo uh, heating loads. Uh, what's standing, the, yeah, go ahead. What's the definition of a green roof? OK. Um, good point. So a green roof is a vegetative rooftop. And I had, I had hoped when I first heard I was doing this, this tour to take you up on the roof. Uh, actually, so the Broadway building has a green roof. Um, but since it's such a large group, I've brought the roof to you. So here's a model <laughs> of what a green roof may look like. And there are many different implementations. But basically, you have the concrete slab on the roof, followed by sort of a traditional insulation block, a, uh, a uh, drainage layer that allows moisture to run off underneath the soil. You have a soil layer and vegetation. So a green roof is basically a vegetated rooftop. Okay, thanks for the question. Sorry, I didn't uh, hit that earlier. Um, so at some of my background in urban heat islands, I was interested in looking at uh, if you massively redevelop uh, air urban areas with green roofs, with vegetated rooftops, how might that impact the urban thermal environment, the urban heat island? because you're, you're likely going to have cooler surfaces, the air is going to flow over cooler surfaces and pick up less heat so you can keep the, the city cooler. Uh, the third question is how do green roofs affect the quantity and quality of uh, stormwater runoff? That's one of the reasons why the city is very interested in uh, green roofs here in Portland is because we have this combined uh, stormwater sewage system and you run the risk when you have a large rain event of having that rain run off into, uh, into the river, really, um, having overflow of the system. And so if the green roof can either reduce the total magnitude of the runoff by absorbing the water or delay the peak of the runoff, that can, can, can help us in some of those severe storm events. And also, it can, help, it can just generally benefit us in terms of reducing the amount of water that we need to treat. And then finally, uh, there, are, there are a number of, of aspects of green roofs that are beneficial to um, the urban environment or to the buildings. And one of the things that we're interested in looking at is what are the life cycle costs and benefits of a green roof. When you put a vegetated roof on a building, it's a lot more expensive than a traditional roof initially. But studies have shown it may last on the order of twice as long. And it may have some energy benefits. It may have stormwater benefits. It may have urban heat island benefits. There's sort of the aesthetic aspect. So there are a lot of, a lot of benefits of green roofs that, um, that need to be accounted for. And so we've assembled a project team, myself working mainly on the urban heat island and the energy aspects of the, the questions. Greg Spolek, who is the lead on the water quantity and quality. And then David Irvin, environmental economist, who does work on the life cycle analysis. 
So just to give you a sense of some of the activities, like I said, we've got a green roof right over there on the Broadway building, the mixed use building. Um, these are a couple of my students doing, doing work. Um, this, is the, this is what the roof looks like. So it's not, uh, it, it's not a forest up there. It's a lot of uh, low ground cover sedum, um, some bunch grass, and then whatever birds have dropped up there. We have cottonwood trees growing. We have a lot of weeds up there and so forth. So one of the things we do is we try to characterize what's on that roof. So we use sort of standard um, methods for, for taking random grids on the roof and looking what's the vegetative cover in that random grid. Uh, we also have established a weather station on that roof. And so it has all the standard uh, parameters that you would measure, measure to weather, weather station. So it has wind speed, air temperature, humidity, uh, has rainfall. And uh, it also has a lot of sensors that, that go down into the soil. This is just a picture of one of the sensors just sitting on top of the soil so you can see it. Uh, this is a moisture sensor. So we use a, a large number of sensors that we put into the soil so we can characterize what's going on on that green roof because the data that we can gather will help us when we are developing and validating models. So a lot of what I do is modeling related, but because there's just there wasn't enough good data out there, um, I needed to become more of an experimentalist and actually gather some of my own. <coughs> uh, one of the neat features of this is we have a little radio transmitter on that uh, weather station. And uh, I have a little receiver here. And what I do is once a month, I, I go to a convenient location and I download the data. And initially, when I bought the instrumentation, I was told we have a five mile line of sight uh, range with, the, with these radios, so I thought, okay, no problem. Uh, and I was hoping I'd be able to get it right out of my office, which is one floor down. But as it turns out, just the geometry of the situation, I think we're bouncing radio signals off that hillside. This is the only room in the entire building where I'm able to download data. <laughs> so, so I'll come up, I roll my cart into that back corner, and I point the little antenna at the hillside, and that saves me a trip across campus, you know, the, the slow elevator ride to the top. So this is another student doing some controlled measurements in a lab where we're looking at the thermal properties of the construction materials themselves. Let's see. So adjacent to my lab, Greg Spolek, and the picture looks better on my computer screen than it does on the projection, uh, has created this lab facility that is basically an environmental chamber where you can blow hot or cool, uh, moist or dry air, and simulate solar radiation, and rainfall. So he can basically try to mimic the conditions that you might have in Phoenix or Houston or anywhere in the US, hopefully, is the plan. We grow test sections. These are two foot by two foot test sections of different types of vegetation in a greenhouse. Then he brings them over to the lab and tests them to look at uh, how uh, they affect the runoff when, with a simulated storm event and what's in that runoff. What, what's, what's, what kind of uh, uh, filtering uh, mechanism do these plants provide, the, do these green roofs uh, provide uh, when you have polluted rainfall and what kind of, uh, what kind of things, you know, chemicals are actually run off of the roof. So he does a lot of work related to that and stormwater retention. He also has capabilities to do some energy monitoring of the heat flow through these sections. So he can test, he can create sort of an idealized scenario and then I can take that information and put it into my model. So that's where I'm going now is the model that I've developed. For decades, building and energy scientists have known how to model buildings. Fairly well established. There are a number of software codes that have been developed. Most of them are based off of one fundamental code that was created in the Department of Energy. Um, also for decades, in a different discipline, people have known how to model plant canopies. And there are a number of codes available for modeling plant canopies. But until recently, no one had combined the two so that we could actually look at uh, what happens when you have a green or uh, vegetative roof on a building. So that was a challenge that I took up about five years ago. I'm not answering it. Phone. I don't have a watch. This is my watch to keep track. Um, and 
so what I did was I tried to put a model of the green roof on the building. And this schematic just shows you the general uh, energy terms involved in, in trying to understand the uh, energy performance of a roof. You have a lot of complexities with how the plants intercept radiation from the sun and re-radiate or, or reflect it, and how they intercept long wave radiation or thermal radiation from the warm surface, how they affect the flow of air past the roof. And so we've created a physically based model that has all of the physics of that in it. So it's a computer model uh, that takes as input design parameters of the green roof itself, the building, the standard sort of building stuff that you would have in a building energy model, the building details, schedules of, of operations and equipment, weather file, that sort of stuff. Um, the outputs are what, what any energy model routinely outputs, which is the hourly uh, loads either for electricity or natural gas. Um, and this, so this gives you a screenshot of what actually we've created. Um, I created this module that'll allow you to model a green roof and the Department of Energy as of uh, April 2007 accepted that as part of their standard release for their cutting edge model. So now anyone in the world who wants to download the Department of Energy's energy model, Energy Plus, they get with it the capability, you can't read it here, but material eco roof of defining a green roof material and then applying it as a construction layer on a rooftop. Uh, I won't bore you with some of these details, but we validated the model against measurements from, from University of Central Florida, Penn State, and our own building, and we've got very good results, so we feel pretty confident about how it's performing. Um, the kind of output that you get from this model, you can compare the green roof to either uh, a, a control roof of your choosing. It can be a dark roof, it can be a white roof, and you can look at the cooling electricity savings as a function of the month of the year, <clears throat> and the, the key is you, you tend to see these uh, areas where you have costs in the winter months, or in the fall months mainly, and then lots of savings in the, in the, uh, in the uh, summer months. Um, if you, let me just skip to the winter savings, that'll get us along a little further. Um, one of the things that's really impressive about a vegetative roof is that, okay, yeah, it saves cooling electricity, which everyone would expect comparable to what a cool roof does. A cool roof is a highly reflective roof, a white roof. Okay. However, a white roof, as mandated as part of the California Energy Code, has actually a gas, a heating penalty in the winter months, whereas a green roof or a vegetated roof saves you quite a bit of energy in the uh, winter months as well as in the summer months. So it's okay. Okay. <laughs> I know, okay. So we're probably two slides away here. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Um, so one of the things that we've figured out in all of our measurements and modeling is that green roofs are complex. And um, you've got this in your, in your handout, so I'll skip that and, and go to the conclusion. Before my energy model came along, people would try to represent a green roof by just saying, oh, it's kind of like added insulation. And we've shown that's not the case at all. Green roofs have a thermal mass to them. They affect the energy consumption of a building in a much more complex way than simply adding insulation. And you know, when they're wet, they have less of an insulated value than when they're dry and so forth. So our model is able to capture that. Um, the next steps, we are trying to take this very complex model and turn it into something that looks like this, something that an everyday user uh, who's not a building energy expert, anyone in this room could take and they could explore what would be the energy savings if I put this style of green roof on my building. And then finally, so I did I had one extra slide. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, I know it was a little bit rushed and you know, sorry for that, but um, feel free to email me. My email's up here, it's, it's on the handout. Or if you want to look at our website, uh, it summarizes a lot of the work that we're doing and I, I've only touched upon some of the things that we're doing uh, with a focus on the green roofs, obviously. Uh, if you want to see what's going on in my classes, you can look there as well. Question? It's probably a dumb question, but the, what happens if you ever get a leak? Okay. Same in terms of expense yeah. and so on. Yeah, it, that, that, so um, what, what, 
what we have with green roofs is the same concept with any roof. You have, you have an impermeable membrane, so you can't have moisture tracked through there. In a normal roof, you'll have wear and tear associated with people walking on it. Um, the soil helps to spread out that load, so you, you tend to not have as much of a load on those membranes. You don't have the UV um, degradation of the surface. So you, you tend to have less troubles with respect to things like leaks. But yeah, if you have one, it would be, it, it's a pain. Yeah. The other question is that you said it lasts twice as long as a normal roof. <laughs> so how long, I mean, okay. do they have to replace the whole thing after um, years? How years so a typical commercial roof might be 20, 25 years. And there's data from roofs in Germany suggesting that they last on the order of 50. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are they typical flat roofs that you can work? Can you can you angle? Can you put some on some angled roof? Yeah, I, I've seen it done both ways. You, you know, the, the easiest thing yeah. is just a, a well. There's no really flat roof. Or they always have some slight grade, but um, I've seen it in both ways. Obviously, the steeper grade you have, the more challenges you have. What, what you have there is you have drainage, so you tend to have drier spots near the peak, and plants don't do as well, and plants do better in certain areas where you got more moisture. Yeah, I'm interested in what you were saying about um, green roofs have essentially the same <coughs> effect as a highly reflective white roof, but actually it, the, the white roofs have a penalty mm -hmm. um, during the winter months, and and most commercial buildings even here are, are in cooling most of the year, but we found, at least in our own work, that a lot of the energy use is actually in the heating portion, or the majority of energy use can be in the heating portion. So in that case, a green roof makes a lot of sense. Do you, you have actually data demonstrating that on your website? I mean, could I go to your website? Um, See that? that would be very useful to people making decisions. Right, yeah. so we, what we've done with, with the model that we've created is we've, first of all, we published the model, so it's peer reviewed. Yeah, we got it accepted by DOE. But now we've gotten to the point where we're, we're running prototypical simulations of buildings across the country to look at what are the costs and benefits? Because there's going to be some cases where the white roof is going to easily outperform the, the green roof, depending upon location and your design. But so we have a paper that's that's in review right now that has a lot of that kind of information. It's not data per se; it's model output. Right. But yeah, we have that information. Is it there? It's not here yet because it's still in peer review. One more question. One more question. Who really wants? The question I have for you: uh, Have you looked at integrating? urban tree cover and the heat island effects. This is not green roof, this is more your heat island research. So we, we just had a presentation yesterday that we've done a lot of work digitizing tree cover mm -hmm. within the region. We can actually get down to individual trees now in terms of tracking them. We're tracking them for habitat value. Yeah. I wonder if there's some connection there with the, your work in terms of urban heat island and vegetative yeah. cover. Yeah, so, so in a lot of my early work, which I didn't show any of here, um, I did that kind of modeling for cities like Los Angeles, mm -hmm. the LA Basin, where we'd ask, what would a million trees do to the urban heat island? The challenge there is that atmospheric models don't readily take you down to the same scale, so you have to look at larger scales, 500 or, or meters or a kilometer on an edge, and mm -hmm. just take sort of average characteristics. Mm -hmm. And you can do that. You can say, let's, let's increase the vegetative cover by 15% and see what that does in the model. And it won't tell you, oh, on, you know, on, you know, Fourth and burn side, you're going to have this effect, and elsewhere you'll have this effect. It'll give you sort of averaged over a kilometer size area. What's the effect? But you're you're not doing that research now. Is it part of your colleagues here at the issue doing that kind of research? Um, not not in that kind of modeling area. I, so I, I I'm still doing urban heat island modeling um, as part of this big NSF project that we've got and other projects, but. Um, in fact, actually, I, I went, I, I gave a, a keynote in a, the World Green Rough Conference in London, and Dusty Gedge, who's sort of their main guy in the city of London for promoting green roofs, um, has subsequently asked me, could I do that kind of modeling for London, where we do the, you know, what if, what if scenarios if we massively re-greened London with green roofs, can I put that in my model and tell them what the urban heat island impact is? And it's a little more challenging because You've got that cooling effect up at elevation, and it's different. You know, is it on a one-story building? Is it on a ten-story building, or somewhere in between? We'd have to take some sort of average effect, but we could do it. It would be an approximation, but we could certainly get sort of the ballpark. Oh, and raising up is that we're spending pretty good money. 
to get this kind of level of very detailed data. Mm -hmm. And we're using it for one purpose. And the question is, can we collaborate? And would that kind of data be useful for the kind of work that you're doing? And how do we, to, yeah. uh, let me just put this in your hopper. Yeah. That there is this new data set that you know, it's pretty expensive to get and maintain. Sure. For our purposes, we want to do it. Yeah. But it'd be great if it was multi purpose, yeah. for example, using. If, well, see, we would all, almost certainly aggregate it up to 500 meters by 500 meters. If there's information that you would have that wouldn't be in existing data sets at that scale, then that would be useful for us. But yeah, we, we don't. We wouldn't be able to take you, make use of each individual tree. We'd have to aggregate it up. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you all for your attention.